We are concerned not merely with the technical problem of securing and maintaining peace, but also with the important task of education and enlightenment. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world tonight. <laughs> John Cameron and I've got a uh, new show today. It's a bit of an entertaining show. And I'm uh, joined by my assistant, Desta Barnaby. How are you doing, Desta? Very good. Thanks, Grant. <laughs> good. And you're back from uh, the United States from your tour. Your, uh, your tour. And, back, and how much more quarantine have you got? Uh, two days. Two days. Okay. It better get warmer. Yeah, well, you came just when it started getting cold. It was actually pretty warm while you were gone. Oh, and oh. and, and my, my guest today is Greg Godovitz, who uh, Dessa and I both uh, met in Toronto. And if you're familiar, is this going to bother you if I wear this mask, uh, Greg? <laughs> no, I wish I had one. Uh, the, the entertaining is over, so we'll, we'll stop that. Okay, so <laughs> in Toronto every year, and not last year they didn't, but in most years in Toronto, and Toronto sort of like the uh, center of the universe, it's a big place and a lot of um, powerful people there and a lot of powerful uh, businesses, and they have a UFO conference, and I'll be talking to Greg about this. Um, uh, Greg has been there the last couple of years, and as you know, in the UFO conference, uh, you have the daytime thing where people are giving speeches, and then you have the the evening thing where people sort of unwind and uh, Greg is sort of like the social guy. He, he runs the social, social committee for the uh, UFO conference. So let's start with that, Greg. How are you doing? And uh, welcome to our uh, session here today. We did you once before. We did your interview, which was very entertaining. A lot of people, uh, you know, really liked it. And uh, so let's start with the, uh, the Toronto conference. Um, you were there quite a bit. You had sort of a role there. You were sort of like the uh, the guy that was at the bar, and you uh, know everybody, and a uh, very social guy. Uh, are they having conferences anymore, and are you still sort of involved? I, I would love to go to another conference. I mean, that's that's three days of absolute excitement and you know information for a guy like me that's so interested in uh, what we do, you know, what you do, and uh, and you know, I've had so many contact things myself and seen so many weird things in the sky uh you know it's a good place to go because nobody thinks you're nuts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and and you're you're a musician we'll get you to go get you right away to go through your background and that was what interested me you know i'd written a book on uh um, music and ufos and you've got the book and you knew a lot of the people in the book and yeah. uh, you're a musician and uh i think i first learned about you through kevin um estrella where uh, we're sitting in the audience and he said, you got to talk to this guy, uh, this, this uh, Gatto guy. And I go like, whatever, like, I don't know anything about music. And he said, um, this guy had all these experiences and uh, you got to talk to this guy. And uh, so we had an interview with you and we, we talked about your experiences. So let's go through your musical background and then get a little bit for the people who are sort of tuning in for the first time to meet with you. Uh, some of your UFO uh, connections and I guess you would agree with me. There is some sort of connection between musicians and weird stuff like UFOs. Yeah, it's funny. The older I get, for some reason, a lot more experiences come to mind. And uh, I've now gone back to uh, being maybe less than three years old. And remember that every time I had a nightmare at that age, I would get out of my bed and go down the hall in my mom and dad's house. And we had that old Burgundy Chesterfield that everybody had back in the 50s <laughs> yeah. with the uh, floral pattern etched in it. And I, my sister and I used to hide behind it and play. But for some reason, and, and this happened a lot, I would crawl behind in the middle of the night behind the couch. And when I got to the end of it, this creature grabbed me and started tickling me. <laughs> and I remember being absolutely horrified. But then my brothers, my older brother, Ted, his face would appear on whatever this was that was. And then I would go directly into a nightmare. Wow. And it was the same. Old, and looking back at it now, it, it's almost like it was a gray. Wow. You know, and, and 
I'm not making this up. I mean, these things happen. And, and it's funny because the last one we did this, I, I remember so I was in a doctor's office one day and the, I was telling the, the girl behind the desk about it. And she she turned that one and she goes, have you seen what people are saying about you? And I said, I really don't care what they say about me. These things have happened. And if they think I'm crazy, well, that's that's fine. I don't really care about that. But that's that's where it sort of started, you know? And I had I had these invasion dreams when I was very young. But it wasn't, you know, it wasn't these guys. Oh, yeah, there you go. Here's your toy. You told me about your toy. Explain this. Yeah, toy. I got this for Christmas. This is my alien cow abduction uh, toy. There you go. It comes with its own cow, which is on a stand, but it always falls off. But the ship comes down. It grabs the cow, and then it starts mooing. <laughs> So Someone loves my, you. They, they, they think about they, they, not everybody thinks you're crazy. They, at least they sort of play to your your craziness by giving you toys. Well, it's you know at my age to be given uh, little kitty toys. They gave me this one as well. It's another UFO that floats in the air and you can oh, like yeah. play it like a frisbee, you know. Yeah. And and, and it, it has a light show that goes on the ceiling. I haven't figured it out yet, but my gal has figured it out. So. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I have no fear about talking about these things because, you know, at some point I'm going to get uh, Leslie uh, Mitchell Clark to do a hypnotic regression. I was going to ask you about that. You've never been regressed because that's what you're sort of describing now is that people think they've had like an experience or two experiences or five experiences and then suddenly they realize they're a lifer. It's been going on their whole life. So well, you're what... doing that, doing the, the regression thing. She offered at the last ACE, you know, to do it and... Uh, I, I don't have any reservations. I just want to make sure we pick the right time and the right setting to do it, you know? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, also, I was just on her show. She has a uh, a show, uh, her and, uh, is it uh, Lee, Lee or Les? The, the, her partner there that she did. I haven't seen it. Yeah, she has a show. So you may have to get on her show because you're doing your new book. So I'll, I'll get you, I'll, I'll link you up and and you can maybe arrange the uh, regression thing because that sort of opens it up. But you you realize that once you open it up, then you can't shut the door again. Well, you know, I'm not really worried about it. I mean, the, obviously something has happened because I wouldn't be having all of these experiences on a regular basis, you know. And uh, especially your book intrigued me because, you know, being a, a songwriter and a guy that writes prose and stuff, Sometimes I don't know where these things are coming from, you know? Yeah. And if so the aliens are writing, my, my, sorry, but let's go through your background. Cause most of the audience I think is going to be American. So they're really not going to be that familiar with Canadian okay. bands. So let's go through right, your background well, okay. of, of your leading edge um, life. And I, I imagine when you were in high school, you're probably considered weird, but not because you're doing UFOs, but because you're sort of on, uh, you know, a musician and you're doing your own thing. So you've always been on the leading edge, right? Well, you know, I started playing music in 13, at 13 years of age in 1964, uh, thanks to the Beatles, of course, like everybody else. And the minute uh, that I heard their music, I mean, I knew that that's exactly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And I'm almost 70 and it's all I've ever done through my life. You, you, let me ask you a question. Let me cut you off for a second. Do you think that may be inspiring? Because you, you may know that John Anderson said exactly the same thing, that when he started, he heard the, he heard the Beatles and it inspired him. It's almost like the, if you you know the story of the communion book with Whitley Strieber, where yeah, a lot of yeah. people saw the cover of the communion book and they said they were almost dropped to their knees. They couldn't believe it. They suddenly realized that, that they had been part of this. Do right. you think that the Beatles may have been some sort of triggering event? Because, you know, Yoko Ono used to say it was like channeling. They were, they were like, like, it was like a seance. They were, they were actually bringing this stuff in that they were no more talented than anybody else. There's got to be something strange about even their story because I mean it's just too perfect. <laughs> you know, I mean yeah. they they always had cameras on them even when they were kids. They had, uh, you know, they had uh, uh, recordings happening when they were in the basement, and then of course that incredible you know worldwide success that continues to this day. Who knows? I mean, <laughs> maybe maybe they're aliens. You know. And, and uh, you linked into them. You, I mean, you had a, a, a podcast yesterday where you were talking and you, you've got some memorabilia. Talk about that, the key piece of Beatle memorabilia that you've got. Well, I have a, I have a front page of the, uh, the Baltimore Evening Sun dated February 5th, 1964. Wow. So this is two days before they came over for Ed Sullivan. Wow. And uh, the caption was on the front page, it was a picture of the four of them. 
it said revered across the British Isles, the Beatles are coming. But all the names except for Ringo's, they, they were set up the way we were supposed to remember, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. But it was actually, uh, if memory serves, it was Paul, George, John, and Ringo. So they didn't even know who they were at this point. You know, <laughs> of course, within a few days, they were going to be the most famous people in history, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been collecting Beatles memorabilia. I mean, I saw them play live. Um, I've met Paul and Ringo. I've met George Martin. I've met some of the wives, uh, recording engineers. I've been really lucky like that because as a first generation Beatle fan to actually, you know, spend a half an hour in Paul McCartney's dressing room, you know, yeah. talking about baseball of all things. <laughs> I, I didn't talk to him about the Beatles at all. I talked to him about baseball and, uh, you know, it, it was, it was great. I mean, but you know, you look at not only me, but but millions of guys over the world. Tom Petty, the guys in the Birds, Roger McGuinn, David Crosby, um, Bruce Springsteen. I mean, you could go on and on and on of the guys whose lives were changed instantly when the Beatles came on Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. Some of us were lucky enough to maintain a, a business out of it uh, and you know being in the entertainment business for 50 odd years I, I mean i'm clocking it at 56 years now so that's that's all you've done right you you've never had yeah, like i a mean i've had other or... little things but I always played music you never worked in a sewing factory or anything like that no <laughs> uh, i did i did work when i went when i moved to calgary uh i, I worked in a music store for a year but that was like a that was a natural, you know. I mean, maybe that was Desta's music store. You know, Desta used to run the music stores across Western Canada. Maybe she was there. Maybe she's running the sh running the show. What, what was do you it, think, Desta? Is the right? <laughs> what what store was it, Greg? It, it, well, it was Axe Music, but I'm suspecting that you were involved with mainly music. No, well, like the CD Plus, they were under a million different names, but cdplus.com oh yeah remember because we know um yeah dave cubit dave cubit yeah, yeah he's, a, he's a great friend yeah, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. sure i've been in those stores many times <laughs> yeah i ran the western canada back in those days they uh, gave me free product did they no it's amazing <laughs> so you start music so let's go through your career like what what bands were you in and and um that kind of stuff i started uh, actually, it, most of that stuff is in my first book, Travels with My Amp. Yeah. Uh, I started playing, uh, like I said, in 1964. I think I have a picture of the absolute best Beatle haircut that a 13-year-old could have back in those there days. You go. I don't know if you Let's can see, see that. that. Yeah, there you go. It's pretty, pretty hot looking. Uh, I didn't. I certainly didn't look like I was 13 in this picture, but I am. When when did they stop wearing uh, suits? That used to be big in the 60s with the Beatles. Well, we did. I mean, I've got a suit and tie on there. Yeah, yeah. Because, that's I mean, what I'm saying. They did, did that it, stop? so of course we did it. You know, that's what you did. Yeah. And uh, were all the girls I, chasing you like the other stuff, like with the bands? Well, we thought they were, but they weren't. No. <laughs> okay. I already had aliens chasing me back then, so <laughs> I, I had no time for girls chasing me back then. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I started out playing in a band with two brothers called the Pilling Brothers, Ed and Brian. They would eventually go on to this group called Flood that I rejoined in the mid 60 or uh, 68. Mm -hmm. They wrote great radio songs. We had eight top 10 hits wow. in Canada uh, before I was 20. And uh, it was a great band. Then they went to England and joined Cat Stevens band. And then I went into the blues band world. I went into the psychedelic. Uh, I was in a band called the Mushroom Castle with uh, Eddie Schwartz that wrote Hit Me With Your Best Shot. Wow. Uh, and then I got into Flood with Brian and Ed again. And, you know, we went to England. We recorded at the Manor with Richard Branson. Uh, we went to uh, Pacific Sound in, in uh, Sausalito and recorded our first album down there. And then I put Gatto together and I've had that band. It was a power trio. Uh, we made 12 albums. Uh, I happen to have three of them right here, which I will show you now. You, you have the one where you have the 24 songs. Tell that story about the 24 songs that all Well, it's you know. this one here. It was our second album, uh, which was called If Indeed It's Lonely at the Top, Who Cares? It's Lonely at the Bottom too. Ha ha. <laughs> and uh, on the back of it, we, we had the original 10 songs on the album, but then I decided to do a walkthrough uh, using alternate tracks and bed tracks so that people could have a karaoke experience with it, you know? And, uh, and they're available at, I, I see you got the crawl on the bottom shop, Greg Godovitz. These were done in England, all three of these, the third album, An Act of God, if you can't see that, hang on. Okay. 
and we'll link the first, all this stuff. The first one, the just the Gato album. And we, we have so many records. I mean, but I've got to get them all re-released on uh, either vinyl. Um, I become great friends with the, the famous uh, Eddie Kramer, who did all the Jimi Hendrix albums. Wow. Uh, he also did uh, four Kiss albums. He did two Led Zeppelin albums. He worked with the Stones and the Beatles and uh, Traffic. I mean, it's easier to say who he didn't work with. And last year, he remixed our very first album uh, for vinyl. Wow. Uh, so that's another project. So, it, it, you know, I've been doing the music thing for a long time. I played with uh, rockabilly legend Ronnie Hawkins for two years. Wow. Uh, it's It's been a great life. Is, is there still money in it? Because you hear the rumors that, you know, in that money is out of it, that, you know, people are bootlegging the music, music and stuff. Is it, Can you still make a living at music? Uh, I can, yeah. yeah. I mean, I have enough, you know, stuff to offer people that they're, they're interested in the history of the band. And, you know, we have all sorts of stuff on, on our website. Okay, uh, what's so, the website? Uh, Shopgreggodovitz.com. There's, okay. there's a little link underneath me. I don't know if you can see that. I don't know. De Des is running the show here. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'll link it in the description. We'll, yeah, we'll link it. You've got other stuff, too. T talk about the, um, we mentioned before, you've got this uh, hot sauce, which I thought was kind of cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, a friend of mine, his daughter worked for this company in uh, Calgary. I don't know if you can read that. It's a bit, it's a bit yeah. blurry. Oh, there we go. I got it wrong. Uh, and the caricature on the front was done by uh, Long John Baldry, uh, the famous blues singer. We were managed by the same company and I walked by one day and, wow. uh, <laughs> and I, I looked over his shoulder and he was drawing a caricature and I said, hey, that's me. And he, he signed it, Gatto, on the jersey and said, as a matter of fact, it is you. And he gave it to me. Wow. And it's a great, it's a great piece, you know. So you sell the prints of that as well, right? We do. Actually, would, would you like to take one second and I will show you the original? Sure. Yeah, John yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it on the other one. So that's Give me a second. that. This is there it here. Go. You see that? That's right? the original? This is the original. Yeah. Wow. And it's signed LJB 1978. And it's a cherished uh, possession because, I mean, of course, Long John Baldry was, hang on, was the yeah. guy that, uh, we'll be right back in just a moment, but first, <laughs> uh, Long John Baldry was the guy that discovered uh, Rod Stewart and Elton John. Wow, you're naming all these big names that are in my book. You got, you got pants on with the stars. Is that, is that got to do with America? Were you, were you playing in the States? No, I just they? stuck. They, they were glow in the dark stars. I just added them as an oh, afterthought. They're not part of the actual uh, uh, portrait. Wow. So, so, so you just, you you had a you had a distinguished career, fifty three years in the music business, and and has it really changed since the sixties, or what's oh, the yeah. difference well, between? First and foremost, there is no business now because of COVID. I mean, oh yeah. I'm lucky in as much as that I write books and I have things that will keep us afloat, but there are tens of thousands of people in the entertainment business and not just musicians, but dancers and crew people yeah. and agents and record company people that are all out of business because there's nothing going on. There's no live music. Yeah. You know, I, I see these incredible clubs daily, uh, of course, I have an affinity with Calgary as well because I lived there for eight years, and, and it's it's devastating to watch what the musicians are going through because of this COVID business. Do you think and it'll come back? Not just musicians, but every time I go out for a drive, I see another place that I go to frequently out of business. Wow! Did did you have your own uh, club in Toronto? No. It's, the The last thing I would ever want to do is work with guys like me. So I. <laughs> I I decided, they always said, why don't you have a Gatto's place? I, said, I really don't want that. You know, I, working with musicians is a pain in the butt, as I found out over the years, and I, I wouldn't want to do that. But I, I'm sure thankful when the guy does open up a club and gives us work. I mean, that's that's what it's all about for us. Wow. You told a story I, on this interview you did yesterday about getting this opportunity to work on a top band, and you turned it down. You're in Calgary or something. Oh, well, Paul Dean is a great friend of mine. Paul... Uh, and we hooked up again in Calgary, but years and years ago, uh, his band Streetheart uh, out of uh, Winnipeg, of all places, mm -hmm. would come and see uh, Gatto play in Toronto at the Gasworks. Then they started putting a new band together in Calgary, and we played McEwen Hall, and they all came out to see us. And a couple of days later, I got a phone call from their manager, Bruce Allen, and he said, uh, 
hi, Greg, it's Bruce Allen calling from Calgary. And I said, how are you doing, Bruce? How can I help you? He goes, we're putting together a Canadian super group and your name came up. And I said, well, thank you, Bruce, but I'm already in one. And I hung up the phone. <laughs> I didn't need that $10 million that Loverboy would each make, you know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, Paul and I laugh at that, but uh, he laughs a bit louder, you know. <laughs> but anyway, Paul and I remained great friends. And uh, look at this, hype after hype. Th this is a record that I did with Paul in Calgary. I'm trying to make it not, there we go. There it's called go. Amuse Me. And it's, uh, well, there we go. I can never, it's, it's like backwards on this thing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's all original music that I wrote when I was living in Calgary. And uh, Paul had said, you know, th these are the best songs you've ever written. So he produced it for me and I worked on it for six months. And it, it sounds like a million dollar album, but we did it really on the cheap. So, so you're talking about music, de developing music. Um, is, are these the ones you had? I think you said you had 24 songs that sort of just came to you. Can you go through the and Because, you know, I do that in the book. I talk about people's inspiration, where songs come from, the dreams, all this kind of stuff. Can you talk about the, the, the process you used? to do some of these albums and how music comes to you? Like, uh, what does a songwriter do when, when it's time to do a new song and a new album? I'll be driving in my car and all of a sudden there's a fully formed song. I, I can see the lyrics like it's written on ticker tape wow. going across my mind. And then I can hear the melodies. It's like someone else is writing them. And I know that a lot of guys believe this. Keith Richard believed it. Paul McCartney believes it. Michael Jackson believed it. A lot of songwriters is that we have antenna. Yeah. And you could be just driving along and you drive through the song and all of a sudden it's in your brain because they come at the weirdest times. Paul McCartney wrote yesterday in his sleep. Yeah. Keith Richards got the riff for satisfaction and then passed out and woke up the next day, the riff for satisfaction, and then an hour of snoring. <laughs> but he still had, so it's funny how these things come to musicians, songwriters, you know? I've never been able to figure, I, I wrote a Christmas song called Christmas All Over the World. Uh, the group was called the Carpet Frogs. They're, they're Burton Cummings band now. Wow. Uh, I wrote it in the shower in October and the whole thing appeared instantly in my mind. And I remember going running, running down the stairs of the townhouse. My daughter, who I didn't know at the time, she was about three. She had a girlfriend over. And meanwhile, here's her father running down the stairs going, ah, so that I couldn't hear anything, and dripping wet. And the little girl said, who's that? And my daughter said, oh, that's my dad. She goes, what's he doing? <laughs> oh, he's going to go downstairs and write a song. Like she was, you know. Well, I sure hope that little girl didn't tell her mother that she saw Jasmine's dad running down the stairs with no clothes. But I went downstairs and I just wrote the song and it's like October. And within a week we had rehearsed it, recorded it, cut down a 15 foot Christmas tree, a real one, decorated it and shot a video for it within a week. Wow. So And it, com and it comes fully formed, right? It's, it's not like fully, a dream where it's all weird. Fully formed. Uh, I, I was at the Canmore Folk Festival a few years back seeing all these young Bob Dylans and Joan Baez's, you know, budding ones. Yeah. And as I was leaving, I just got this idea in my head and I could see it. And the lyrics were this, J. Edgar Hoover was my mother. <laughs> as mothers go, he was like no other. He liked to dress in women's clothes. There's nothing wrong with that. And it goes on about, you know, he owned pantyhose and he liked to, I mean, and I wish I'd punched him in the nose. Anyway, I, I had nothing to record it on. So I phoned a friend of mine up and I said, don't answer the phone. I got to record something. So I phoned him up and I sang it and he called me back and he goes, what in the name of hell was that? I said, I don't know, but it just appeared in my head, you know? And once again, it was like, it was written down. I could see it scrolling by, you know, and, and, I don't know. I just, I just wish if the aliens are supplying me with lyrics, they would step it up a bit. You know, <laughs> give me some better lyrics. <laughs> you know, how That's about how... Bohemian Rhapsody, guys? Come on, you know. So, so what, what do you think is going on? Do you read? Uh, let me ask you. Do you read music? Like you hear a lot no. of musicians do not read, and people don't don't believe that when you tell them. Like the vast majority of the big musicians can't read or write music because if you're to me it's like the left brain music is you practice practice scales practice read music you read music and it's a it's a very uh sort of learned thing 
Whereas like a, a right brain musician who's like very famous would just sit there and wait for the song to come to them. And people can't believe that, that, that most musicians, really good musicians are like all jazz, all blues music. None of that was ever written down, right? I don't think anybody would dispute the fact that Paul McCartney is the greatest living songwriter in history. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he writes oratorios, he writes classical music, he writes jazz, blues, rock and roll, pop, everything. He can't read a note of music. Yeah. yeah and, I remember and, him saying, I've never played a scale, nor do I ever intend to play a scale because it would ruin my creativity or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, I've, we have one of our albums, An Act of Gatto, has got a, a instrumental overture at the top of it called Anacana Panacana, which is a palindrome, yeah. right? Yeah. And I got that sort of from a Three Stooges bit, except I found out they didn't actually have the last A on it, but it was very similar. And uh, it's all of the songs from the album that I had. I was on, I was in the Bahamas working on the songs. And while my bandmates were out on the beach having fun, I was in a room writing things down and figuring <laughs> out what we were going to do. But then I had this idea that I could take the melodies from the songs on the album and get me an arranger that could actually notate. And we sat at a piano in the studio and I hit a note, an E note, dun, 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 dun. And he goes, what do you want? I said, I want that to be cellos coming in. He says, well, the voicing is wrong. What's that? I said, he says, well, it wouldn't be in that register. It's going to be down two octaves lower. So that's what we did. And then he started playing it correctly because he could play piano. And I plucked out, ba -da 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 -da, which was the mel guitar melody of one of the early songs in the album. I said, I want a trumpet to do that. And then we brought in uh, half of the Florida Symphony Orchestra Wow. And we recorded it and we, we used it for 45 years as our overture when we came on. And the minute it dropped, people would go, oh, they're coming on. And they all went crazy, you know. Wow. But I don't know how that I mean, you know, I, I've written sitar music. I don't know how to play the bloody sitar, you know, <laughs> but I know what I want to hear in my head, you know. Yeah. And now you mentioned before you were you had some sort of connection to a psychedelic band and you, you may know or may not know Dust is now editing a book I just did on psilocybin. Uh, 16 high dose sessions with tape recorders, uh, protocols, uh, recording what happened. What, what do you think the influence, did you have any influence from psychedelics? And do you think that that had a lot to do with the music of the 60s and 70s of shifting the whole culture around? So talk a little bit about the psychedelic world, because you were in that, that well, age when this was all going on in the 60s. Oh, yeah. And we experimented with it, uh, you know, like a lot. I remember the first time I heard Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced album, I was sitting in some guy's house that had a, a full length wall of salt water aquarium. And Hendrix is on and we're on LSD. <laughs> and I'll swear to God to this day that those fish all gathered right in front of me going, we know what you're doing. <laughs> well, Hendrix was playing. And it's great, you know, because Eddie Kramer is my friend now, like I said, and yeah. he did that album, right? So he says, that's what you did. He said, yeah, well, that's what we all did. <laughs> but, you know, we used to play gigs on acid. You know, I remember playing at the, I think we opened up for John Mayle and the Blues Breakers at the old rock pile where Led Zeppelin played and everybody. And, you know, we all dropped acid to play on stage. <laughs> but we knew that the audience all dropped two tabs of acid. So we were okay, you know. <laughs> wow. Uh, so let, let, let's maybe go through a little bit of your, um, the UFO stuff. Let's tell me the story about the plane. I always like the story of the plane and maybe a couple of other stories that sort of will sort of relate to people that you've had a fair bit of experience with some, whatever you want to call it, intelligence behind the UFO phenomena or whatever you want to call it. All right. Well, there was one, we were coming back, uh, my wife at the time and I were coming back from the Bahamas. So, you know, the flight path does go over the Bermuda Triangle, but <laughs> coincidental, okay? And she looked out the side, and it, there was just that beautiful bed of cumulus clouds that you see when you're up there, this never-ending yeah. cotton field of, you know, yeah. white fluffy stuff. And she says to me, Greg, what is that? And I look out the window, and there is this gigantic object just hovering on the clouds. And... Uh, there was no light emanating from it. There was no vapor trail. It looked like a cone made out of smoke. So it was completely pointed at one end and it was round at the other end and it was gigantic. 
gigantic. I'd say it was the size of a battleship or an aircraft carrier. You wow. know, like it was big. So ding, 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 ding. And we call the stewardess over. And I said, what's that? And she goes, holy shit, you know? And then she goes instantly running down to the cabin to tell the pilots. Yeah. Now we watched it, like, it didn't seem like anybody else on that side of the plane really noticed it. I mean, it was yeah. just either they were sleeping or they were reading or they did have their, you know, the blinds shut, but nobody was going, what the hell is that? You know, except us. And uh, the woman walked by us a number of times. So finally, it was out of sight. No, it wasn't moving because we were moving. It was still fading in the distance until we couldn't see it anymore. And she came back and I said, so what was that? And she goes, what was what? And I went, oh, come on. I said, you saw that thing as well as we did. I said, you know, lady, if I had, now this is way pre 9-11. I said, if I had a gun, we'd be on our way back there now to have a look. She <laughs> says, don't even, don't even say that on this plane. We land in Toronto, we're told to stay in our seats. Another crew came on and they removed the crew that was on our flight before we were allowed to exit the plane. Wow. I mean, so what, what does that tell you? That they were taken off for a debriefing, you know? Wow. When we got up to the top, I said, hey, I, want, I got some questions I want to answer. So we, they said, we don't know what you're talking about. So that was pretty weird. That, that leads to another question. I was trying to set up an interview with you with uh, Joe Wood from the Rolling Stones, married to Ro Ronnie Wood. Sure. He tells the story of having the sighting on the Stones plane, describes exactly what you're saying, where she's on with her son and her son sees this thing and says, Mom, what is that? And it's this orb coming down the side of the plane. And then she says, I don't know. And it goes back down the other side of the plane or whatever. And she said, nobody on the plane saw it except for them. The, everybody else was sort of like they were comatose or they weren't paying attention. So it leads to the question of, and you can go to your next UFO sort of uh, connection, is do you think you've been chosen to be involved in the UFO game? And if so, uh, w why you and, w and what's, why are you seeing UFOs where the average person will say, I've never seen anything? I really can't answer that. I don't know why, but they seem, <clears throat> as Stu Bundy from MUFON Canada says, they seem to follow you around, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, I think I told you that a, a, maybe about six months ago, I was lying in the family room where I like to read on this little couch and I look up and I see a ball of light about the size of a cantaloupe, I guess, yeah. bouncing around on the walls. So I look outside to see if there was any sort of light coming in through the, you know, yeah. through the window, and there wasn't. And then it went on our wall unit, and it was really buzzing around like a bug, you know. Yeah. And I'm calling to my gal, who is pretty much she's uh, on the fence, non-believer, you know, yeah. living with a nutcase like me that totally believes. But I called her. I said, "Come and see this." And the next thing I knew, it flew through the glass and went through the room that we're sitting in now. And that's when I lost sight of it. And I'm sure it was one of those orbs that you guys were always uh, talking about. What did, what did she have to say about that? Well, she didn't see it. So. Oh, I see. I, it disappeared before she got there. <laughs> I, I finally had something she could witness and she was cooking or something and she didn't see it. Yeah. Well, that's usually the pattern is that you, it's almost like you don't have any support. Nobody has any support. Every around you and it's almost like to keep you stay uh, sort of grounded where well, I'll, I'll tell you a story that's exactly like that there's there's this place i told you about in the dominican Repun, uh, republic yeah it's called uh, castillo mundo king okay it's well you got upside down, down. <laughs> you're, you're like uh, you're like trump with the bible there you know, please <laughs> let's let's let him go away quietly shall we uh, this is falling apart now, but this is what the castle looks like when you see it in real life. If you can, can you see that there good? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. So this is, I don't know, 20, 30,000 square feet. It was built by this uh, German fellow named Rolf Schmidt. And it's, it's absolutely full of very, very strange. Here's some of the artwork right here. Let's see if we can get this one. In. Uh, where are we here? Right there. Let's see if we so oh, yeah. this is one oh, of the yeah. paintings that's there. Wow. And the whole place is full of these things. Uh, alien, you know, they're, they're taking brains out of people. <laughs> it's like, it's really weird. And a friend of mine that owns the place where we stay in the Dominican in Sasua, he says, we got talking about UFOs. And he says, well, I got some place you got to see. And 
he was out jogging. He'd been living there for 10 years. He was out jogging and he ran up to the top of this hill and stumbled across this castle, but no one had ever mentioned it to them. Yeah. Uh, the Haitians wouldn't go near the place because of they, they said it had a real bad voodoo to it, you know? Yeah. And uh, so we went up there and we walked in there and we ran into Rolf. Uh, I actually got to meet him a few times and we went, you know, looked around the place and uh, we, we finally got up to where Rolf lived in this little tiny room. He had like a big antique German bed and then tons of books written in German. And he reaches into this box. He's digging around in it because he knows I'm a believer. So he yeah. wants to show me what he's got. And he comes out with a, a marble about one of those marbles, like the, the big ones we used to play with when we were kids, but the yeah, big yeah. ones, the Aggies. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, um, it was opaque. It was amber colored, but you could see that there was something inside of it. And he put it in my hand. My hand was outstretched and he said, drop it. And I dropped it and it bounced over my head. Wow. Now that goes away from everything that we know about gravity and physics. Yeah. You'd have to throw this thing, even if it was Indian rubber, you would have to throw it bang to get it to do that. I just dropped it from waist level and it went over my head. And it's the only catch I ever made, but I caught it. And I went, what is this? And he goes, this is what the spacecrafts are made of. Wow. And he was telling us that the material on the ship was so malleable that it could go through solid objects. Wow. So uh, I said, so you're, you're telling me that the aliens visit you, right? And he goes, yes. I said, what do they look like? He goes, I've never seen them. Uh, I'll drop the German, the faux German accent. Now. He says, I've never seen them, but I can smell them when they're in my presence. Yeah. And they communicate telepathically with me. I said, what do they want? He goes, they're going to destroy the planet. <laughs> oh, that's charming. How? He goes, they're going, to, they're going to ignite the carbon dioxide in the clouds, which is uh, interesting, yeah. yet compelling. Uh -huh. idea you know that you could ignite the carbon di dioxide and i guess effectively suffocate everybody you know and i said well why are they going to do that he goes we're in the way now he's no longer with us but every time i went to the dominican i always took people one day i i was with graham sims you know that wrote the book about shag harbor okay yeah yeah he was just walking by the the beach in cabarete and it was run by a canadian guy and uh, he'd hailed me in, and then I found out he was a Canadian. So Graham walked by and I said, hey, how you doing, man? Where are you from? Halifax. Hey, hey we're Canadians. Come on and join us. What do you do? He says, I'm a writer. What do you write about? He goes, I wrote a book about Shag Harbor. Huh. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> okay. So I took him the next day to the castle and he freaked. He said, I've never seen anything like this. After we left, he had to go someplace else. But my daughter and her friend and I were walking down the beach. And this guy says to me, hey, do you want to see something unusual? I said, yeah. So there's, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people on this long beach. And this guy has stopped me. And he goes, look, and I points up in the sky, took me a while to find it. There's no clouds in the sky. There is a bright white light yeah. hovering above the beach. I could see it. My daughter could see it. Her girlfriend could not. The guys, that, the Spanish dudes, the local guys, the, the Dominicans that that sell the trinkets, they could all see it. A lot of the other people that came over going, what are you guys looking at? They couldn't see it, but we could. And I mean, what are the chances? We just leave the alien castle and all of a sudden there's one right over me on the beach. Yeah. I mean, it's just weird. And this guy who I didn't see again said, hey, you want to see something weird, you know? <laughs> so, so what happened to the alien castle? Uh, I think Rolf's daughter was trying to... Uh, I sell it. I mean, it's full of priceless carvings and the furniture is all beautiful, like sort of, uh, I guess, Spanish hand carved. And then all of this absolutely crazy artwork that's everywhere in it. Maybe Desta could put up the uh, the Earl for uh, Castillo Mundo King that people after this, they can go and have a look at what it is. Uh, but I always thought, you know, I showed it to Stanton Friedman and, and a bunch of the, the guys that were, yeah. you know, talking. And they said, we'd never heard of this, this place. Who did the art? Done by people in Haiti and 
Oh. I, wherever else he was getting it from. Because you know but I'm he, doing that series on art. I did a little bit of the music, but I'm doing art now. How many ex artists are UFO people? It's, it's unbelievable. And, and I'm, so I'm doing the whole thing with UFO art. So it'd be kind of interesting to see where that came from and where it all ended up. Because there are actually people who collect experience art. Do you do art? Are you an artist? I do phenomenal stick people. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Same but they have, they have really good cartoon bubbles. So it's like just <laughs> totally amateurish stick people, but they have incredibly, you know, poetic and, and profound statements coming out of their cartoon bubbles. <laughs> and, and we were mentioning before, talk about the painting behind you. We were talking about you're, you're in this uh, sort of art gallery thing there. What's that all about? Is, you know, well, I wish I could adjust the camera, but it, yeah. it's a famous painting. Uh, originally, it was very small. I, I walked into a, a what you would call it, a... Uh, auction one day and I saw it on the wall. I said, I'm going to own that. And I got my paddle and they, uh, they started it out at $5,000. So I put my paddle down instantly <laughs> and I bought it for 150 bucks. Wow. Well, hang on. Mrs. Claypool is going to raise it up so you can see this. There so what go. it is, it's a cardinal who's fallen asleep. No, it's got to go down a bit. Okay. And then over this way, so I can see right there. Perfect. There you perfect. Go. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, my assistant. There you go. Uh, so he's fallen asleep. He's dropped his Bible down there. You can see that. Yeah. He's, he's been drinking wine. You can see that. And the guy who's painting him is scratching his head because, you know, he's he can't, where can <laughs> he go next? But where this falls down as the original piece of art is that the guy's already painted his face. So what does he care if he's asleep? Paint <laughs> around him. You know what I mean? <laughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's eight feet by four feet. And I've been lugging. I took it to Calgary with me. I mean, it's just... It's yeah. just one of those things, you know. And you've got some other collection. You got another other stuff there. Oh, we got you know the whole room is full of artwork, you know. Wow. Uh, and and then we have the Beatles stuff all downstairs. I mean, every room is decorated with different. I collect folk art, you know. I love I love folk art. So. Okay, well, talk a little bit more about the Beatles stuff. Where you? I guess you've been to the museum in in Liverpool. I've never been there. Never oh, been to Liverpool. I've been there twice. I like that. I'm not even a musician. I've been well, there you know, it's funny. Well, is this a place that Pete Best has? Uh, I don't know who owns it, but they have, uh, you know, it, it's a big three-story thing. and It's right on the same street on Matthew Street, right? It's on the, right on the, on the harbor thing there beside, you know. Okay, I think that's a different, I think that's, it's called the something docks. Uh, there's a different one. Oh no, I think no, it's just on a small street, right? There's a small street, and it's well, Matthew Street is where the Cavern Club was. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's where okay. it is. Yeah. So my fr my friends, uh, Pete Best is a friend of mine that was oh, the original okay. Beatles drummer. He's actually been to our house for dinner, wow. and his brother Rogue was Neil Aspinall's son. Neil was the head of Apple Records, and he had an affair with uh, Pete's mom, uh, Mona, and Rogue came along. And they've got this that Beetle Museum. I, I've never been there, but uh, he keeps inviting me. Wow. So, so what have you got for memorabilia? You mentioned the newspaper article. What else? Well, you? I've got all the original posters for the movies. Um, I've got a lot of the toys. I've got hundreds of original magazines. I've got the uh, the Swedish uh, window curtains. Uh, I've got the wow. UK bedspreads. I mean, I, I've got a massive collection, and. Uh, you know, it's all on display downstairs in, in the, the room where my guitars all, all are. And it's uh, my music room, you know, and it's, it's a wondrous place to hang out in because it, it's just all full of good vibrations. You know, it's the Beatles, you know, it's yeah. how, how, how much better could it be than that? Well, you've been pretty lucky. You, you know a lot of the big uh, names in, in music. I, yeah, I've met a lot of them. I mean, you know, I, got, I met Paul first and then I, I got to meet uh, Ringo uh, a couple years ago. Um, Never talk to UFOs because Ringo, you know, Ringo didn't in any interview. He was talking about extraterrestrial life in the back of the uh, the uh, the limousine that he was in or whatever. He's, so they all seem to have that sort of weird interest. And John Lennon had the John sighting. saw one. Him and May Pang saw one in New York yeah. on the Hudson River. Yeah, and, and then the kids. Was John he says was, he, it was, was just floating down in the sky over top of the Hudson, and they saw it. And yeah, and they had the screaming. bizarre, almost like yours. They had the bizarre thing where. May Pang talked about how, you know, time and space seemed to stop and everybody was missing from the condos. And, and then this thing comes in her head. Oh, they all gone to the Hamptons. And we actually asked her, we said, well, that was kind of weird. Everybody went to the Hamptons on Friday night. Yeah, it was kind of weird. But it was like this Oz effect where they were in the middle of this thing and, and the, the photographs wouldn't come out and just very bizarre. So um, you, you had the same thing. Tell me the story again about the one on the plane where the guy 
where you're yeah. on the plane with the guy and he you think he's an alien oh i'm convinced he was yeah uh, i had my son with me everybody always says oh you're out of your brains i said actually i wasn't i had my three-year-old son on a trip yeah. we were flying back late at night from uh, winnipeg of all places and uh, we got on the plane and he was crying and there was some guy sitting at the window seat and we sat down and I didn't even say hello. He didn't turn around. So no big deal. Got my kids settled. Uh, plane took off. The lights go down, just the dome lights and the running lights. And then this guy, the stranger turns to me. I still didn't look at him. And he says, do you know what a Foo Fighter is? Now, there, I can't recall if there was a discernible accent or yeah, roboticness yeah. to it. It was just... The question. Now, people like us, of course, are totally aware of what a Foo Fighter is from World War II, yeah. and they'd be those orbs that flo yeah. floated around while the, everybody was machine gunning everybody over the English yeah. Channel. Uh, so, you know, this is this is 20 years before Dave Grohl put the band together. So that's where Dave Grohl got the name for his band. Wow. You and I know actually happened to go to a cottage north of the city. And uh, my, my good friend, John, his daughter married Pat Smear from the Foo Fighters. Wow. And it's funny, I've never told him this story, but I go to his cottage all the time and he's up there. And one of these days I have to tell him this story so you can tell <laughs> Dave Grohl this. So anyway, I start telling, like I do, I start telling all my stories about everything I've seen. And at one point, he's not saying anything, he's just listening. And I looked down and I saw his left hand on his knee in the dome light. And I, I will swear to God to this day, his, his fingers were 10 inches long. Wow. Now, I know he didn't book onto the flight like that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm instantly looking, and I'm, he could see I was staring, red, like, like freaked out, going, what? <laughs> and that's when I finally turned to the right and looked him in the face, and I lost consciousness instantly. Wow. And to this day, I still don't remember what he looked like. I couldn't remember him when I woke up. I'm sure he was there, but I, it was like, erased from my mind which is the reason why i want leslie to take me back to that flight and find out exactly what i was looking at you know wow that'd be fascinating it was i mean it was weird but i mean it, i'm not i wasn't hallucinating i wasn't making this up i mean i looked down and went what and just the fact that the first question out of a complete stranger's mouth was do you know what a foo fighter is yeah. in other words if you do you're my subject wow you know so your whole life, I mean, you mentioned this orb thing. So it's, is it pretty constant through your life that you see stuff and weird stuff happening? And is there other stuff besides UFO stuff? Because a lot of experiencers will talk about, uh, well, you'd mentioned the orb, but, you know, a ports, things appearing, disappearing, things manifesting, uh, synchronicities. Have you had all the other weird stuff going on? Well, yeah, when I was extremely young, and I've never got to the bottom of what happened, but my mother got, she, she had... I think at the time she would have had my two older brothers and my one younger sister. And uh, she was in the hospital with something life-threatening. And I was sent down to this ancient house where my grandfather lived down on Dundas Street in the old part, Roncesvalles area. And my aunts were there and there was, it was very solemn. Something weird was going on. And they took me upstairs to the top attic where I was to sleep. And I was really young, three or four maybe. And I remember lying in bed and all of a sudden I looked on the wall and there was the shadow of a man standing beside a bed and somebody lying in the bed. And I remember looking instantly out the window. There was no light coming through the window, but the light was on the wall. And all of a sudden the man bent over and lifted. It was a woman he was lifting out of bed. And I went running, screaming downstairs and told my aunts. And, and what I saw, I think, was my father lifting my mother out of the hospital bed. Wow. So, I mean, that's pretty paranormal, yeah. you yeah. know. So, but these things keep coming back, you know, and I go, yeah, I remember that, you know, it's, uh, but they're coming back slowly, you know. Yeah. Whether or not I got anal probed at some point, I don't know. I hope not. But. <laughs> so, you know, not long ago, the kid across the road who's well aware of my interests uh, sends me a text the day after and said, did you hear those sounds outside last night? And I said, no. So the next night, I go out to have a smoke. All of a sudden, I hear this huge metallic clank. Clank. 
And he comes running out, he goes, that's the sound. And we, we meet in front of his house. And fortunately, because of the way our ears are designed, I could hear this thing with 10 second intervals, clank, clank, clank. I'm, I'm in the sky with my phone taking pictures. There's nothing up there. And I'm recording the sound. And we yeah. could hear it go to the end of the block and then go south and clank still. And then it made, it made a right and came up the other side of the street and came up to us again. And then it jumped north about what seemed like three or four blocks. It was bouncing off the apartment buildings behind us. And we're both sitting there going, what the hell is this? <laughs> but there was nothing on the camera, which I didn't expect, but there was no sound recorded. And it was loud. Wow. Like these huge metallic, like it was something taking giant steps. Okay. I was glad it didn't step on us, whatever the hell it was. <laughs> but, you know, that's just enough. And then, so now all of a sudden I've got him and his wife and her girlfriend and they're going, we can hear that too. We can hear it moving, but we can't see it, you know. Just the two nights. So he saw it, the, he heard it the one night and then both of you heard it. Nothing since then. It hasn't well, I called up Stu at MUFON instantly. Oh, yeah and told him, he says, of course you're here. here. They follow you around. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, now the kids are believers across the road. And, uh, and it's just another mystery. But it, Stu told me that if it comes back again, I'll send a crew over and we'll do what we do. Wow. So I'm hoping that it shows up again. You know, I mean, maybe not. But <laughs> Wow. So let's go through your books now. You, you, you did your first book, which we talked about before. So a little go about a review of your first book and you you got another book that has just come out correct so let's go through that uh, yeah so the first book uh i wrote in 2011 i think okay and basically it's the first 20 years of my life as a musician so it goes from 64 to 84 and it covers you know the psychedelic era it covers uh the blues era the pop era the beatles thing and all the bands and all the people that i met uh back during those days uh and it did very, very well. So I started writing part two of this book and I wrote about 150 pages and I just, I just threw up my hands and said, this is boring. It's exactly like the other book. I don't want to repeat myself. So I started writing short stories. Oh. And that's what this book was. Uh, and actually the featured story in this book is called Aliens et Moi. And of course the French word for and is E.T. So oh, Aliens, yeah. E.T., Moi, and it's all of my stories about, you know, my encounters with whatever this is that's happening. But there's also stories about um, going to, why going to the Dominican Republic and only taking winter clothing is probably a stupid idea. <laughs> so it's, it's like slices of life. And then there's a lot of musical stuff in it as well. The story of uh, Steve Lukather is a friend of mine from Toto. He took me up for Ringo's rehearsals at Casino Rama in Aurelia. And uh, I got to, you know, have dinner with uh, Steve and Todd Rundgren and Leland Sklar and Greg Fillingaines. And finally, one night, Luke says to me, you haven't asked yet, would you like to meet the boss? Huh. And I said, what, Springsteen's here? And he, go, he starts laughing. He goes, no, that's what we call Ringo is the boss. I said, well, that's OK, because I've already met Springsteen. So, yeah, sure. So we went the next night and an assistant came out before his, his opening night show. I'd been there for three days. And uh, he says, no photographs, no autographs. I says, that's fine. I just want to shake the guy's hand. He goes, that's not going to happen. He only bumps forearms. And right at that minute, at that moment, the door opens and Ringo comes in and he goes, I don't shake hands. I just bump forearms. And I said, that's exactly what he said you would say. <laughs> So he starts laughing, you know, so I said, you know, I've been here all week. Uh, I've been the only civilian. Uh, I said, you look great. You're singing great. It's too bad you couldn't get anybody good in your backup band. And he started laughing, right? Because he's got Steve Lukather and all these great classic musicians. So he starts laughing. And then it was suggested that he gets his picture taken with us. Wow. So, you know, I got the picture in the book of us, you know, with, I had Jeff Healy's uh, bass player, Joe Rockman, because he was a friend of Luke's as well. And he was my date that night. And so the two of us got our picture taken with Luke and with, uh, with Ringo. But it was amazing how normal these guys, these guys, like when I met McCartney, it was like talking to you. You know, I mean, you know, the guy's a celebrity and everything, but he's normal, you know? Yeah. 
but you're still in awe of it, right? I mean, when you're in the room, not the really. Place. No, no, no. That was in, in fact when we left there, uh, Joe Rockman said to me, the bass player, he says, "How do you do that?" And I said, "What?" He says, "Man, you were like so cool in front of that guy." I said, "Well, he's just a drummer." <laughs> So how many how, how many UFO stories have you got in the book? How many different? Uh, I don't little... think there's any more than what you know about already. Uh, I mean, they, they're still coming to fruition in my mind, you know. So uh, I've started already working on my new book. I, I realized that when this one was done, I had nothing in my first book about my childhood, which was as messed up as my adult life. You know, I mean, I was working downtown when I was eight or nine years old delivering coffees and danishes you know my mother worked at the friars tavern where the hawks that became the band played so I, I would go every saturday afternoon and watch leave on and the hawks my mother saw bob dylan play with leave on and the hawks the first time when he was hanging around toronto before he took them on i mean you know meeting david clayton thomas down there as a 13 year old i mean i had some interesting encounters as a child so i put a lot of that stuff in the book um and then I realized I hadn't written anything about my eight years in Calgary. So I realized this is a trilogy I'm writing here. And uh, so the, the new book is entitled The Idiots Trilogy Part Four. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've, had, you've had an interesting life. You feel lucky that you've been pretty good life in terms of what you've done and... Unbelievably blessed. I mean, I, I wouldn't... There, there's a few things where, you know, I, I could have, you know, turned this way and, you know, had fairies and elves and everything, but I always seem to go the other way, like I said. Uh, I sort of sometimes regret that because with that turn, I could have made millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, but fate had it in store for me to do other things. A lot of my friends are no longer with us. Yeah. And most people that read my first book and they read about me riding around on the tops of cars going 100 miles an hour, which I used to do quite a bit, wow. or jumping from balcony to balcony 30 floors up in hotels. Wow. It says it's incredible that you're still alive. Oh, my goodness. So I must have some sort of guardian angel looking after me. Now, granted, I won't even get on a stepladder now. I mean, <laughs> back in those foolish days, I mean, it was like, come on, let's, let's drive through downtown Montreal, two of us on the top of a car doing 80 miles an hour, you know? Yeah. For some reason, no one ever hit the brakes or we would have been like Superman, you know, with yeah. a bad ending. Oh, my goodness. So when COVID ends, are you still going to be in the music business? You still going to play or have you got any plans other than your book? Well, Eddie Kramer and I have been talking about going out and doing small theaters uh, with me doing my stories and uh, playing music for an hour. And then Eddie coming on and doing his slide presentation about working with Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and all that, which I've seen and it's brilliant. So two man show, one roadie, one person selling merch, we're in. Wow. You know, but so you'd be whether doing or not Canada I'm, or US or world, how, how big a thing you're looking at? Well, I mean, Eddie could certainly tour the US. I mean, no outside of pockets of friendly people down there, I'm not really well known in the United States. Yeah. After this, of course, I'll be known as this loony from Toronto that uh, <laughs> thinks aliens live in the back of his head. Entertaining loony. I mean, put that on there. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll get around to it. I, I've got a bit of a problem with my hands right now that need, uh, I need a couple of operations because I've developed this thing called Dupuytren's contracture. See, you see how my thumb is crooked? Okay. I can no longer hitchhike because they wouldn't be able to tell which way I want to go. <laughs> I want to go that way, apparently, and, and it won't straighten out. Wow. And I've realized that millions of people have this bloody disease. My dad had, they call it the Vikings disease. So you can see it here and here. Okay. It's making playing guitar extremely difficult. So I, I need to have an operation on each hand and then a year of convalescing. And, wow. and then I can get back to playing music again, you know? And, and what's quite a style of music if you were to, did you do numerous styles like from the 60s and change or what was your style of music that people would? Well, Gato was known as a hard rock band. It was a trio, power trio. Okay. But our records, like because I was producing the records, I didn't, and I, because I'm such a Beatles freak, if the song needed strings in it, I put them in. If the song needed a grand piano player in it, it went in or a horn section 
or a kazoo or whatever the hell made the song sound the way it should have sounded, they went in. But nobody seemed to mind live when it was just the three of us. And occasionally we would get a horn section or we'd get a keyboard player with strings and everything or a spare percussionist that could add harmonies. I had no problem with doing that either, as long as it was always fresh and something different, you know? So it's hard to say. I mean, no two songs on any of my albums sound the same. They're all different, which is what I liked about the writing thing. I didn't want to repeat myself, you know? Wow. And, and it surprises me, like you mentioned, and you'll hear, I remember they talked about... Um uh jackie gleason he had his his orchestra and he couldn't read or write music or whatever and the guy he would just sort of hum a, a piece to somebody and the guy would write it down or whatever but he yeah. could hear every sort of mistake anybody had made a mistake in the orchestra he could pick it out and the guy had made a missed a note or whatever and it sort of amazes me you were just saying you know that you need a a horn in this section and strings here it just amazes me that you can put this together that you know not only the song, but what kind of instruments you need. And, and uh, you'll hear people say, no, no, we need this kind of instrument instead of that instrument. And it amazes me that that comes to you naturally that you sort of know. Totally. Well, you know, I, re I remember when we did, we were in Orlando, Florida, recording the Act of Gato album. And I'd written this song called Chantel, which is half in English, half in French. So it's like Michelle, like the Paul McCartney song. Yeah. But I said, I, aside from the strings, I need, we had a string quartet come in and do it. I said, I need an accordion player. I wanted to hopefully find one of those little squeeze box ones like they have in France, but I couldn't find one down in Florida. So this guy came in and I'm lying on the floor and I'm giving him the melodies to play. And he goes, these are, he says, how do you, you're a guitar player, right? I said, well, bass player, yeah. He goes, how do you know? I said, I watched a lot of Lawrence Welk when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so that paid off with, uh, you know, knowing what the accordion player should play, you know? Uh, and it's always been like that. I mean, it just, and, and I'm not going to say it's anything to do with me. It's, it's really good training because of George Martin, what he did with the Beatles, because he brought all those harpsichords to like in my life, sped up harpsichords. And then, you know, they would reverse the tape and do things backwards. And we learned all those tricks when we were coming up too, because we, we started recording during that era, you know? Wow. Old school, old school, we call it. Yeah. Yeah, fa fascinating. Anything, anything we haven't discussed that you would want to bring up? I mean, uh, uh, in terms of your books and and what you've got uh, planned. Well, I think that anybody, both of my books are apparently very, very funny. <laughs> so yeah. that's that's a saving grace, and especially during this time, everybody that's bought a copy of the book has said thank you. I could use a laugh, yeah. and so even if it's a couple of days of reading a book and and getting away from your troubles. Uh, it's it's worth having a look at and plus you know for people out there your people that are music musically inclined yeah. or love music as much as they they love our our you know interest in ufos and ufology uh the music is good so why not have a listen to it you know yeah there, there's a guy in salem massachusetts that did a uh he reviewed the the three english albums for classic rock magazine under the banner the greatest group you've never heard of <laughs> 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 I loved it. And it gave us nine out of 10. So it was, you know, it was a good review. You know? Wow. Fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. Any questions you have, Desta, you want to ask? No, I don't think so. I just wanted to hear the story about the, uh, the plane and the, um, the orb outside. And yeah, I think we went through everything. Great stories, Greg. Thank you, Desta. Beautiful. And well, I sure we'll... hope we get to do the, uh, the ACE thing again, you know? Yeah, I don't know if I told you, but the first time I went to the one down in Brampton, I don't know if you were at that one, or Brantford. Were you Brent, at that Yeah, one? yeah, 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 I was there. Yeah. That's when Nick Pope was there. And uh, Foster, Campbell Foster, or Foster Campbell, the guy that has the pyramid thing that you can sit oh, yeah. under when you're hung over and it makes it yeah. go away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it works, actually. Uh, he introduced me to Nick, and I said, can I buy you a beer? And 10 beers later, we had to help Nick back to his room. Yeah. <laughs> and the next day, he had to do his lecture. And he wouldn't talk to me after that. <laughs> I didn't twist his arm. I just offered to buy him 10 drinks. You know? Yeah. 
it, you're you're famous for that it's like it because it's always we're doing the conference it's like okay we're gonna meet you at the bar i'll buy you a drink and it's like off off you go and you're like that's why i call you like the social director it's like you know people want to unwind and it's like well where's greg like, where are we going tonight you know well, you know, I'm sort of used to that lifestyle from my time on the road, because that's all we did. You know, we finish the gig and we go to the bar and the party mm -hmm. starts there. This time bringing the guitar was smart because, you know, I got to, you know, play with, sing with Travis Walton. Did you sing? Did you play with Travis? Was yeah, he there? it was great. And, and, you know, we became friends of a sort. I mean, I don't, I've got his phone number, but I don't bother him. I'll see him the next time he comes up. I mean, you know, wow. I gave did him my book. It? No. What's that? Did they tape that with you and Travis? I'm yeah, sure I'm taped. I do. Yeah, oh, I'm sure wow. somebody must. Have. <laughs> I'll send it to you both. Well, we have to put it on YouTube. <laughs> no, no, I'd like to see it first because there was a fair bit of alcohol involved. <laughs> it's oh, Richard right. too. Oh, there you go. Like, we got an exclusive here. I mean, I didn't know about this. I, I, went, out of, I went out and bought Richard. It took me all day to find a Long and McQuaid and I bought him a couple of harmonicas. And he came, I came back and gave them to him. And we were supposed to get together that night, but then that thing happened where somebody got on the stage and who shall remain nameless because he's my friend. And <laughs> everybody got all bent out of shape about it, as they should, sort of. Uh, and then Richard wouldn't come down and play that night. Yeah. And he also wouldn't accept my friendship on Facebook. So Richard, if you're watching, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's his friends with him. She'll, she'll calm him down. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I have great respect for the guy. I love his wife. I mean, she's just fantastic. You know, she's she's a real down. She's like Desta. She's really totally down to earth. And anyway, oh, says, I didn't do anything wrong. I mean, that that's the cool part. Desta and I we used to do that. Um, most people don't realize you go to UFO conferences. You got to get involved in the the social aspect because that's when sort of people unwind and you get to see not the guy on the stage who's you know holding back on stuff. Uh, Desta and I used to do it at the hotel room where we'd set up a camera in the hotel room and then everybody'd come in the hotel room and then we'd say, oh, the camera is going to be running and they go, yeah, oh, whatever. And they would be very conservative till about the third drink. And then we'd be taping this and you'd hear people <laughs> talking about stuff they've never talked about before. And I think that's a, that's a good thing is that, uh, you know, we get this exclusive. We actually had the one where we put up with, um, with um, Linda Howe talking about her cat in the portal. And, and then as soon as it happened, she jumped on the bed like she's going to grab this cat in the portal. And, and I went to Dessa, I said, do you get that on tape? She said, yeah. So we, <laughs> that's the kind of stuff people don't realize that, that if you, if you, that I always said with Stephen Greer, when you, when you, when you go to the Stephen Greer lecture, don't go to the lecture, forget about the lecture, go after when he's signing books, when he starts to get very uh, loud and starts naming names and stuff. That's what people got to realize in the conference um, that a lot of stuff happens not at the conference. It happens like in the bar or it happens in a hotel room or whatever, where you see some stuff that you'll never see before. People talking about stories they've never told about. So yeah. I, I'm glad that you've done that kind of stuff. And and we'll talk to Desta and you review this thing. I would love, even I would love to see this tape. This is because I, I was with Travis once in um, in Maine and I saw him playing the, the guitar there. And he's sort of famous for the guitar, but I don't think I've ever seen him on tape playing guitar. Yeah, he's he's rudimentary. You know, he's he plays yeah. farmer chords and he knows a lot, a lot of like old classic songs and stuff. So we hit it up as musicians, you know. Yeah. And then I gave, I told him some of my stories. The thing I love, like I said earlier about Ace, is that you go there and nobody looks at you like you have three heads. You can tell <laughs> the weirdest stories going, and nobody goes, you know, you're insane. You actually believe that, what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. So when you're talking to a guy beside you that actually has three heads, you, you just accept them, you know, for her. You know? That's what, I love that element of the ace thing because you, you could actually talk to people that have had similar experiences. Uh, like Steve Boucher, for instance, the guy that was abducted, oh, yeah. the yeah. musician. And people think he's crackers, but man, his, his story is like bulletproof. Yeah. Did you he know? play with you? Was he was he part of it? Well, he... yeah, he was part of it. Yeah, yeah. it's great. He's wow. a great musician. Yeah. Uh, you know, the funny thing was, remember at the the beginning of the last one, they, they let people from the audience go, experiencers go up and say something, and yeah. I think I opened up mine with saying, "Hi, my name is Greg, and I'm a I'm a UFO holic," <laughs> and then afterwards, Richard Dolan came up to me. He says, "What do you do?" And I said, "I said well, I'm a musician." He goes, "He says you're very funny." He goes, "He says these things are usually so dry." And you walked up there and had everybody laughing within like 20 seconds, you know? Yeah. I said, well, one of these days, maybe they'll realize that I should be up there 
just telling my stories, but in a funny way for 20 minutes and do a bit. I, I think they should, because that's how I learned about you is, is you were up on the stage and you were you were pretty funny and you were telling these stories. And that's when Kevin Estrella turned around and said, oh, this guy is this musician. You got to talk to this guy. You're doing music. And I go like, oh, OK. And they said, I got to meet this guy. And and that's how it happened. I, I, I oh, saw you did. and I said, man, I got to uh, I've never heard of this guy before. And I've got to talk to him. We've got to interview. And that's when we went up to the hotel room and we did the interview because I, I was just you. I think you should. I, um, do you know if Stu's going to have a uh, or the MUFON if they're going to have an event? Because I'm know sure they will COVID. once this, once this thing ends. I mean, yeah. I can't see why they wouldn't because they've got to be doing well with it, um, and you know people are getting paid for being there, so they've got to be covering everything. Yeah. And not only that, it's it's a great three days away. Yeah, you know, I, you, I will definitely push you if if they're going to have another one. I will make sure that you get on stage because uh, you were you were pretty good on on stage. You were, as you said, I mean, you had people laughing and. And it is, it's true. That's why I said, it, like, when you go after to the events after, like in a hotel room or in the bar, it, it's much more laid back and people are talking about stuff they never would have talked about. On the yeah. stage, a lot of people are holding back. They don't want to look stupid. You know, they don't use people's names and stuff like that. But you, you, you see, I, that's the difference. I've looked stupid most of my life. I've been, <laughs> I've been in the public eye for 50 odd years. So I really don't care. Yeah. And someone's, you know, I'm going to see this come out eventually and someone's going to go, this guy's crackers. You know, this guy's insane. I really don't care. I mean, I'm just, that's why that's why you don't have to get me drunk to get these stories out of me. <laughs> like when I came up to your hotel room with you and Destin, and we did that thing. I knew full well what I was getting into. And then, you know, like I said, one day I'm in this massage clinic, uh, like, a, you know, getting my neck adjusted. And, and this girl, I told her about it and she dials it up and it was your interview. And she and she says, have you seen what people are saying about you? And I said, no. She goes, they think you're nuts. I said, I don't care. Yeah. I think that's more concerned with what you think of me because you're in the same room with me. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that maybe they're interested in musicians, because musicians really don't care. I mean, they're basically they've been on the leading edge. They've you know like you, they've been driving on a car at 80 miles an hour on top of the car. They they are they're very right brain. They're not very rational, analytical. Like figure this out because if you're left brain, then it's like oh we got to check this ten times. Let's do another course. Let's think it over before we do it. Musicians are just like on the leading edge. And they yeah. really don't care what people say. Uh, it's spontaneity been that forever. Yeah. Sp spontaneous, you know, spontaneity yeah. for me. That's that's the key element for. Is let's see what we get. If we're doing too many takes of something in the studio, so let's move on. To oh, yeah. Because yeah. the, you know, the freshness has already gone out of it after two or three plays. You're now you're thinking about it instead of just doing it. You know. So when I'm producing someone or recording myself, it's spontaneous. It's got to be first take. Let's get this guy's bang, you know. And we yeah. had tremendous luck with that in my solo album. A lot of, uh, especially the vocals on on uh, this album here, uh, on Amuse Me, which I yeah. think I gave I, I've given Desta one of these. Uh, the most of the vocals were scratch vocals while we were tracking the band. Wow. And this guy named Russell Broom, who uh, he discovered Jan Arden great guitar player he called me up because he played guitar on a couple tracks and he says if you touch those scratch vocals you're crazy man he goes <laughs> it sounds like a guy singing in front of a rock and roll band because you're not dogging it wow you know? and there's even missed words in it like a word that doesn't really exist because i, I missed two of them but put them together yeah. i just left it in last question after you sort of went public with you know with your book and the interview that you had this you know, a little more public about UFO stuff. Did you run into other musicians who had bizarre experiences as well, UFO, where you sort of ran into them? And it, it's it's pretty well common knowledge of my interest and my experiences yeah. with people. So anytime I run into somebody that has had, uh, after the interview I did yesterday, I got a number of people saying my husband had an experience and it ended up in a, in a book. So they're out there. Wow. And and now with us getting as it's as it would seem closer to disclosure because of what happened with the New York Times yeah. and the Washington Post and all that. Uh, I mean, why wasn't that the number one story on the news around the world that the, the Pentagon says these things are real? Yeah. And nothing <laughs> like 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 oh hey Mildred UFOs are real apparently that's nice take the garbage out I mean like nobody yeah. cared. But it, that's where it, it, the advantage goes to you that if you're giving a lecture that I think a lot of people are just into entertainment. 
So it's like, we still got to pay the bills. We got to go to work, all this sort of stuff. And for a lot of people, the New York Times thing was, oh, that's pretty cool. That's okay. What's the next story? Like what? And that's why I think you would be, be good on the circuit in that uh, you're, you're just telling stories and you're not taking it that seriously. And uh, well, I'm not an expert. I'm not like you yeah. or Richard yeah. or Nick. I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not one of the, you know, the cognoscenti yeah. of the UFO world. I'm just a normal, well, an abnormal guy that, yeah. that's had, a, you know, an abnormal sort of life that is chosen. Yeah. I, I'm going to say what you said, chosen to, or I yeah. wouldn't be seeing these things. I mean, and having yeah. dreams about them and stuff. I mean, there's something there. Maybe, maybe that's your role. Maybe we'll get, we'll get you on the circuit and, uh, that's it's so entertaining and it's uh, you know musicians people love to hear musicians and uh, someone like you who's met a lot of the big musicians they may not know if they're not from canada they may not know that much about you but uh, you've been in the thing and you appeal to the guy on the street and that's that's where where it's at and i know how to play mr spaceman by the birds there you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll add that to your thing. You can play that at the end of your uh, little session. I was actually going to do it at the last ace and then something happened where they said uh, our timing is wrong now. I said let me let me lead off the last day by just walking on stage and playing Mr. Spaceman and wow. walking off. And they did, and for some reason they didn't want to do it. I went, "Okay, fine." Wow. You know? Maybe we'll have I to did get it you in the tape. bar that night and got free drinks. There you go. Maybe we'll get you to tape it and we'll put it on the end of your tape here. And we'll... <laughs> <laughs> I can't play it right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've got your, your problem there. Oh, yeah. Okay, Greg, thank you very much for this. And uh, hopefully we see you in um, Toronto later this year. Um, I'll probably be in Toronto at some point this year and I'll make sure I stop by and see you because I'm, I'm heading to uh, Nova Scotia and I'm coming back. One of my assistants is in Toronto and we want to do some stuff. So Okay, I, I got one. I got one last thing I want to end this with. Okay, yeah. look at the screen, folks. You're getting sleepy. <laughs> sleepy. <laughs> you will go to www.shopgregodovitz and buy all of his products. There you go. Or else the boogeyman's going to come and get you tonight. <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. Thank you, Greg. Pleasure. Right. It's always a pleasure. Very entertaining. Thank Thanks, you, brother. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Tess. We'll talk to you soon.